And so, Tamadaya, what's your reaction to when you we, uh, were actually able to study these 165 pages? Well, I'd say first, I mean, it really follows the contours of our investigation on the January 6th committee. So I'm not shocked by anything here. And it does uh, uh, confirm the story that we told, which is that the former president knew that these lies he was telling about the election to the American people were all false, and he proceeded nonetheless. What I was uh, a bit uh, taken aback by in a good way was how Jack Smith has been able to use his tools as a federal prosecutor, tools that we didn't have. I previously was a federal prosecutor, and the power of the grand jury subpoena is something that the committee couldn't use. And what he could do here was force people to sit with him in a way that we couldn't. One of those people here is uh, former Vice President Mike Pence. And the detailed communications he has between Pence and Trump are going to be really powerful testimony or trial, and they do what uh, clearly Jack Clinton focused on, which is the mens rea, which means the state of mind, which is critical to proving guilt or trial, and he's done that here. He shows again and again that Trump knew he was lying, and Mike Pence is going to be a critical witness if this ever goes to trial. And I'm just thinking, you know, those five pages that Ken was talking about that the vice president, then vice president, took contemporaneously as this whole event was unfolding, and also the uh, Jack Smith mentioning that they were able to determine what what the former president, what the then president, was doing on his phone during those hours. That's kind of access to information that you all just simply couldn't have. That is correct. That, and we were both limited by our time pressures, but by our tools. And Jack Smith has done exactly what we expected the DOJ to do, which is to go further than we could. So, Danny, when you're looking at this, and especially from a defense perspective, those are a lot of tools that are very effective. Yeah, and I'm really glad Temedio is here because this goes to what I was thinking as I read this, which was I didn't see a whole lot of new factual nuggets that blew me away, that were blockbuster. Uh, to me, everything that was new was kind of consistent with what we've largely known over the last several years. So, for example, finding out that when Donald Trump is told that Mike Pence is in danger and he says something as callous as, so what?, didn't surprise me. I would have expected Donald Trump to say something like that. So as I'm reading this, I think about the dual mission. The first mission for the government is establish that these are private acts and not official presidential conduct. But secondly, they've laid out their entire case. And I can't tell you how rare that is, not just for a criminal defense attorney or a defendant, but the public to get a preview of the government's case, especially in a complex case like this. This is not a drugs and guns case. This is a very complicated case, and the government, in 100-plus pages, has laid out essentially their entire case with what I would call less redactions than I expected. Uh, the people are redacted for the most part, but we can kind of divine who they are. So for me, it was the legal argument I found compelling. Yes, the, the quotes and the texts and the messages, what Bannon says about Pence's lawyer, it's flashy. But to me, the legal argument, the way the special counsel lays out that the executive branch's duty is not to be involved in state and local elections, even citing Abraham Lincoln, going through history and explaining how this is not the role of the executive. This is the role of other branches. He had no business in this area. Yeah, and I'm just, if you just kind of leaf through some of it, you look at the majority of the redactions are really in the footnotes, right? Where, where it's kind of to qualify who the individual is or not. But Those there are, are appendix very citations. little, right, yeah. very little uh, of the actual text. And so, Tamadaya, let's talk about, and I was just asking earlier, Ken, about the timing of this, right? Why do you think that the judge decided to release this now? And there is a difference between what the judge decided to do and what the DOJ could have suggested or not. Well, the delay here, or the timing, is all because of the former president. It is because of Trump. He has sought, and successfully, to delay this case again and again and again. This case could have been resolved much, much earlier, but for the obstruction through legal processes of the former president. So I think to, to look at Judge Chutkin or the DOJ here, I think, is misguided for anyone to do. And we must remember, the public has a right of access to the court system. The public has a right to understand, in any case, what's happening, and especially in a case of this kind of national importance. So we should actually be happy that this has been unsealed, because the public should have this information. The question is, it's when it is unsealed, and there is no doubt a fact that we're less than 30 days away from an election. 
Well, as I think Judge Shutkin said at one of his first uh, court appearances, the former president, he is defendant Trump in front of her, not President Trump. The fact that in his private capacity he's seeking another office, that is his choice. First and foremost, he must answer for the crimes he's being charged with. And so, Danny, how are you seeing this from a defense perspective? What do you think are the main arguments to rebut these 165 pages? Sure. Thinking like a defense attorney, one of the things you'll expect is, number one, they'll argue that, hey, all these terrible things that people are saying, make them riot, do it, cause trouble at a polling facility. Those were other people. And Donald Trump is clever enough that he doesn't create a whole lot of a uh, digital trail in terms of text messages, emails, all the things that traditionally, and Tim Adayo could tell you this as a prosecutor, these are the things that sink defendants in the modern age. And Trump, you're not going to find a whole lot of that other than his Twitter activity. So you're probably going to see a defense, at least at trial, that these were things other people said and did. They didn't do it at my direction. That's for trial, at least in the immediate, because now the mission is show the court that these were official acts. So the argument with Pence is clear. You're going to say, hey, even if it had to do with the campaign, I'm a president talking to my vice president. Therefore, the presumption lies because the presumption is that communications with Pence will be immune. The government just thinks they can overcome those presumptions. And they've done a really good job of making that argument. So that's going to be the defense's argument essentially here. Yeah, it may have sounded like it was about the campaign, but here's some element of presidential official conduct. We're immune.